On today's World Insight with Tim Wei, a summit between Putin and Trump is set to take place in July. I think a lot of good things can come with meetings with people. Could this be the icebreaker to thaw Chile relations between Moscow and Washington? And the European Union leaders are holding a summit to tackle migration. Can they come up with a consensus dealing with tens of thousands of refugees turning up in European shores? Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live on CGTN. U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton visited Moscow to help set the stage for the summit between Russian President Vladimir Putin and U.S. President Donald Trump. Both sides announced the Putin-Trump summit will be held in Helsinki on July the 16th. Since the two sides have been at odds over accusations of election meddling and many of the other issues, what changes could this summit bring to their relations? Take a look at this first. Mr. Trump's national security advisor was in Moscow for a meeting between Trump and Putin. They agreed to hold the much anticipated summit between the two presidents in July. Your visit to Moscow raises our hopes that we can take the first steps to restoring full fledged relations between our governments. Bolton said it was Trump's own desire to meet Putin. And he judges correctly, in my view, that uh, this bilateral summit between uh, himself and President Putin uh, is something that he needs to do and will do regardless of political criticism at home. But the meeting is sure to bring criticism from certain corners of Washington. Already poor ties between the U.S. and Russia worsened in recent months over the conflict in Syria and the poisoning of an ex-Russian spy in the U.K. Washington joined a collective action by Western countries to expel Russian diplomats. Both sides are also at odds over Ukraine and the Middle East, as well as allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The summit is seen as an icebreaker to get relations back on a positive track. Well, I think we'll be talking about Syria. I think we'll be talking about Ukraine. I think we'll be talking about uh, many other subjects, and we'll see what happens. So you never know. You never know about meetings what happens, right? But I think a lot of good things can come with meetings with people. Since Mr. Trump took office two years ago, he only met his Russian counterpart in a few international events. Amid increasingly strained ties, the summit between Trump and Putin could indeed be a big step in improving relations. So, could the Putin-Trump or Trump-Putin summit be the break in diplomacy it's cracked up to be? Let's loop in our panelists with us in Beijing, Ye Hailin, who is with the National Institute of International Strategy under the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Welcome, sir. In Arlington, Virginia, United States, we have William Courtney, a retired U.S. ambassador and adjunct senior fellow at the RAND Cooperation. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. And in Moscow, Russia. We have Mark Sleboda, who is an international relations and security analyst. Welcome as well. Let me begin by asking you, Ambassador Sloboda, about the latest development between Russia and the United States. This is going to be July the 16th meeting between Putin and Trump. Very first time bilateral meeting, besides the earlier opportunities of uh, uh, meeting on multilateral basis. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, this is a, a meeting that President Trump has long wanted. He campaigned and won the election on the issue of improved relations with Russia. But the political witch hunt um, with the uh, Russiagate uh, scandal and investigation at home and opposition within uh, Congress has prevented him thus far from meeting. So I think he's really looking to fulfill a campaign pro uh, uh, promise, but he's also looking to use this meeting mm. primarily for domestic purposes. 
purposes. And I think the Russian government really needs to be careful about this because Trump is all about political opportunism. And he's looking, he's imagining how he can spin this uh, into the midterm elections I in see. the United States that could determine his political fate. All right, Ambassador Corney, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Ambassador Corney, therefore, I want you to respond to our Russian guest who said earlier that President Trump is taking a political opportunity out of this uh, bilateral meeting. And having said that, though, we know the so-called Russian meddling investigation is still going on. James Clooney is certainly is not a favorite name for President Trump. President Trump ran uh, primarily on trade and migration issues and improving the economy. Uh, Russia was not really a factor in the election. This appears to be more of a personal issue with Trump than a political issue. Uh, Trump himself has had some ties with Russia in the past, you know, sponsoring a beauty contest uh, in Moscow. He seems to want to have better relations, but the summit with Putin holds probably more risk than opportunity for President Trump in the United States. There's a strong bipartisan consensus, both mm. Republicans and Democrats in Congress, uh, to be pretty firm on Russia with regard to its aggression in uh, eastern Ukraine, its annexation of Crimea, and its military intervention uh, in Syria, which has involved a lot of atrocities. So, um, Ambassador Courtney, with that in mind, is uh, President Trump trying to stretch his muscles when he's having this bilateral meeting? Remember very clearly in our earlier quote, Mr. Bolton, who is being labeled as very hawkish within the administration, said this is a personal decision made by President Trump. He is just there in Russia trying to be a messenger. So it seems that there are words that he hasn't spoken and yet spoke bigger or louder than the ones that he already talked about. Ambassador Courtney. Uh, well, I think that's, that's correct. Uh, so for President Trump, he will want to find ways to improve relations with Russia. And that's not a bad thing, because it's important for major powers, great powers, uh, to have positive aspects of their relations, whether it's in uh, consular activity, people-to-people uh, -people diplomacy, commercial relations. Mm -hmm. uh, and those provide ballast or uh, an underpinning for a political relationship. But the president will have to deal with difficult political issues as well. Hopefully he can make some concrete progress on some of the lower profile issues, for example, reopening consulates that have been closed between uh, Russia and the United right. States, and reanimating people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. Mm. Mr. Sloboda, I have to come back to you about the Russian side's analysis. I mean, you see this administration in the Washington not necessarily having very good terms with their European allies. And also there are threats coming earlier, coming from President Trump, suggesting that the U.S. is not going to contribute as it used to be to NATO, which is a, a defense alliance between the United States and its European allies across the Atlantic. So uh, what would this mean? A plus, not to mention, not to forget that, there's trade wars, believe it or not, going on between the United States and some of its European allies, and maybe China as well. So. Uh, under these circumstances, how is Russia going to meddle it well and keep that balance that it's gonna, not going to offend anyone as a result of this meeting, but at the same time be able to push what Russia has in mind as the agenda? Yeah, Russia, uh, President Putin is going to be a, under a lot of pressure in this meeting um, because he has to deal with uh, Trump's domestic politics at home, Trump's divisions with the EU and NATO, his uh, trade war essentially on the entire world, threatening tariffs and sanctions against allies uh, from Turkey uh, all across Europe to Germany and so on. Uh, but, but there's a lot of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, illegal actions around the world, including the push 
putsch that they have backed in, in Ukraine uh, that overthrew the democratically elected government and continues the mass murder and atrocities uh, against its own civilians there. The U.S. Uh, illegal proxy war and its military occupation of eastern Syria and uh, uh, nearly constant and routine U.S. meddling uh, okay. in elections around the world. And Trump is going to be under pressure to bring this to the table and have uh, some kind of dealing with it with the United States. Right. Some of the controversial issues, I'm sure Ambassador Courtney wants to respond later. But for now, let me go to you, uh, Mr. Ye, here in Beijing. You certainly see both sides coming from two analysts have concerns about this meeting. They see it, it could be a political loss for actually the president of their own country. Uh, but at the same time, you see these two are likely to meet. And President Trump said very clearly when he's meeting with the Portuguese leader at the White House, saying to the press that, you know, it's very important to develop, quote, relationship with, good relationship with Russia and China, end of quote. So, uh, Mr. Ye, how do you read uh, President Trump now his intention? Yeah, I understand it's a good for, uh, it's a very good for uh, American if you had a good relation with uh, Russia and China, but the definition of good, What's the definition? Is it good for American or good for the world or good for Russia and China? So there is a lot of question. But in my understanding, actually, uh, Donald Trump's idea to get a better relation with, not very good, better, getting mm -hmm. better relation with, the, uh, with, uh, with Russia is basically two reasons. Firstly, due to his personal ideology and his personal thought, on the uh, global issue, he really wants to get a better relationship, uh, sh sh relationship with Russia. This is a personal judgment. Secondly, due to the domestic, the, the midterm election pressure, he has to take this chance to try to get rid of the so-called the scandal. Mm -hmm. So in, based on these two reasons, he, w he wants to meet uh, President Putin. But mm -hmm. for Russian side, I think only creating a warmly atmosphere is not enough for mm. Russia. Russia want to see what the actual achievements could be made by these two countries. Mm. So there's a lot of questions and the problems and issues between these two countries. I won't say such kind of a summit will create or repeat the history in 1986 when uh, Gorbachev meet uh, President President Reagan in, no, in, in no. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's far away. So <laughs> it's it's a only a uh, first step. And nobody is suggesting that, uh, Mr. Ye, but certainly great analysis over there. Uh, Ambassador Courtney, about that, if this is going to be a political makeup for President Trump about midterm election, he's certainly doing it with a lot of danger. It, what if the Russian side are asking really specific things? And what if the domestic constituencies, as you said earlier, are asking President Trump to raise some specific issues with Russia, which the other side certainly would not like? Well, the Congress, for sure, is interested in President Trump's raising uh, Russian election interference in the 2016 election here in the United States, Russian aggression in Ukraine, and Russian activities in, in Syria, where uh, a lot of uh, a lot of really um, uh, humanitarian suffering is really a, a result of the kind of conflict that uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, with Russia and Iran have supported. So that will be an interest for Congress. For President Trump, the midterm elections, the timing of midterm elections, and the summit are not really a related issue. Uh, President Trump is concerned, of course, to uh, have the Republican Party do well in the midterm elections. But this summit, unless there is some uh, big problem, this summit will likely not have an impact on the midterm mm. elections. But, but uh, Ambassador Courtney, just to be frank here, I mean, we know that President Trump is sailing politically right now, despite some of the controversy he had recently with some domestic issues, whether it's immigration or others. But you know what? Uh, Republicans are already calling the party like Trump Republican. And whoever the candidate during the seven primaries that he tried to support has, in a way, already got some very good uh, result, not to mention the midterm election. So when you are saying President Trump is only thinking about the bilateral relations between Russia and the United States, it seems that it's a little bit less than what exactly the content is. And by the way, uh, why, 
in a way, would President Trump think it's important on a personal basis to develop relations with Russia? Uh, and what, what can the Congress do if he tries to go out there and do it? After all, the Congress has not reacted much about any of the things he has been doing. Uh, you're correct that uh, candidates in the primary elections, uh, Republican primary elections, that President Trump supported tended to do well. The issue, though, for the midterm elections in November are the uh, independents who are in between, if you will, the diehard Republicans and the diehard Democrats. Mm. And it's less clear how successful President Trump is going to be in convincing the independents uh, to support uh, his goals. Uh, but those elections are going to revolve around a number of issues, including the economy, the trade wars that uh, have been started now, uh, immigration issues and others. The U.S.-Russian summit is just not likely to be that important an issue uh, in the midterm elections, nor is the NATO summit that is coming up just before the summit with Putin, mm. uh, unless there are some unusual major problem in one of those summits. Okay, Mr. Slabada, here we go. President Trump, before meeting President Putin, he's going to go to the NATO summit. He's also going to visit the UK. Of course, this is already a series of exchanges he, he has had with his European counterparts. Some of those were not necessarily very pleasant at all. So uh, is Russia going to be a supporting point for him in his still lack of strategy approach of international relations while he is coming further into his term, at least the first term. Yeah, um, I think President Trump has long wanted to, to bring a much needed dose of realism and kind of transactional relationship with other great powers to U.S. foreign policy, something that he's met a great deal of resistance from the, the blob and the deep state uh, in the United States, um, and from many of his uh, European allies as well, at least some of the older ones, uh, although he uh, seems to be receiving support from the new prime minister of Italy um, and the, the chancellor of Austria, and that's going to make these meetings really rather interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump has, in many ways, his actions have alienated many of his traditional allies, and he's called into question uh, the value and the cost of this uh, NATO uh, alliance and the immense U.S. military footprint uh, right up on Russia's borders mm -hmm. uh, in Europe that it maintains at, at great expense while Europeans are, are, are kind of bandwagoning along and not paying their fair share. But so I think Trump is facing, a, 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 this is combined with pulling out of the Iran agreement, which right. was not favored on in Europe. Trump is facing a great deal of political isolation from traditional U.S. allies. And he may be looking at this meeting as a way of, of, of legitimizing uh, and bringing uh, the okay. U.S. out of some of the isolation that it has been under. Well, Mr. Ye, mm -hmm. there are things that on people's mind. When both sides announce at the same time talking about they're going to discuss national relationship with one another, they're also going to discuss international issues of common concern. For example, the Korean Peninsula nuclear issue could be one of those that both countries are having a part in. That they are the former members of the six party talks, we want to remember that. And having said that though, there are also issues in the Middle East. Syria is certainly one of those, but there are others as well. Meanwhile, there's issues for example, China has been developing quite close relationship with Russia. If you see the interactions between Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Russian President Vladimir Putin, it's enormous amount for every year over the past two years. So, uh, Mr. Ye, how is China looking at the roadmap, if there is any, President Trump is setting for him leading up to the midterm election about international relations? I don't think that the international issue will be the crucial for the midterm election. No, it election. is not. Yeah, but uh, for the, the, the issues you mentioned, they, uh, probably will be discussed during the, this summit. I think uh, these two presidents will spend a lot of time on Syria case because they need, really need to find a kind of a solution or compromise for the two sides to avoid the further uh, confrontation. But the Korean Peninsula, I think they won't spend much time because not the situation is manageable. And for China, 
I don't. I even doubt whether the president Putin and President Donald Trump will mention the China as a factor because uh, obviously two presidents that they all know their relationship with China, uh, no matter for the United States, United uh, U.S. side or for the Russian side, uh, won't be the very key issue for the their relation with another big, co big country. So right. in China side, we will hold the neutral stance for these two countries, and we hope these two giant, the global giant, could. Um, uh, through this summit All to right. result some uh, neutral or uh, balance situation and to avoid the further confrontation. But personally, I don't think such kind of the summit will bring so huge achievement for, mm. for this world. Ambassador Courtney, what do you think? Uh, well, with regard to Russia-Chinese relations, uh, it's important that they do have good economic and cultural and other relations. Uh, Russia is in the middle of two of the three largest markets in the world, uh, China and, and Europe. Uh, so it has a key role to play in, in promoting commerce uh, in that uh, big, vast you know, region of the world. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the United States is concerned that both Russia and China are seeking spheres of influence by using coercive measures. Uh, in the case of Russia, by invading Ukraine, also invading Georgia in 2008, uh, and of course China with uh, some of the uh, East and South China Sea uh, island issues. Uh, so uh, I think from that standpoint, the sphere of interest issue with regard to Russia will be an important issue at mm. the Putin summit, but not with regard to China. I'm sure, Ambassador Courtney, the Chinese and the Russian guests will not agree with your earlier statement. Having said that, though, we are running out of time for this discussion. Mr. Sloboda, I want to come back to you about some of the specific issues, particularly in the uh, Trump administration. You heard about the Secretary of State Pompeo talking about the U.S. is still trying to pressure its European counterparts to severe uh, trade ties with Russia. But on the other hand, you also see uh, the... Uh, uh, National Security Advisor Mr. Bolton going to Russia on behalf of President Trump. So it, it could see that there are already quite some controversies within a very small group of the key decision makers or advisors of the White House. What can we expect if things are already this intense even within a small group of power? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's much agreement between Trump and many of his advisors, uh, certainly not with John Bolton, on the issue of the United States. But um, I, I think Trump is going to try to use this meeting as leverage against European countries. And in NATO, the specter of improved relations with Russia is actually appalling many of these, and he may use this as leverage against them. Likewise, he can't meet any of his foreign policy goals mm. in Iran and North Korea uh, without Russian assistance of, of some kind, or, or at least Russia uh, abstaining from, from some of these issues. I see. Um, Likewise, um, I think we're going to see a fallback to some of the, the measures that the U.S. and Russia always go back to when their relations hit a low point. Nuclear nonproliferation, um, uh, arms control, mm -hmm. and strategic stability. And we're looking at a start, uh, new START treaty and an intermediate-range uh, nuclear forces treaty that are due to expire. And the, the two countries really need to start dealing with setting rules mm. of the road going forward okay. for these and strategic issues, as well as cyber warfare, hypersonic weapons, machine learning, and, uh, and artificial intelligence well, in the military the and so on. on. I'm not sure whether they will be it. able to handle all of these issues. If one or two of them could be talked about and talked about well, mutually, that's already an achievement. Mr. Yi, a final word from you very briefly. Yeah, I hope they can result some positive, but I really doubt. I even think such kind of a summit will bring some negative impact to the middle term election in the United States, but uh, it won't bring anything right. to f uh, President Putin in Russia. Negative to whom? Well, that's a question mark. Thank you so much, Yi Hailin, William Courtney, and Mark Slavod. I really appreciate gentlemen for being with us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei, still to come on our live program. European Union leaders gather in Brussels to deal with the migrant crisis. Could this mean reprieve for asylum seekers or shutting the door to all migrants? We'll get some answers after this break.
You are watching World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. The program is going to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Let's move on to the ongoing EU summit. The bloc's leaders are gathering in Brussels. Talks about migrant policy are on the agenda, though EU leaders are deeply divided over what to do with legitimate asylum seekers. Meanwhile, the UK and other remaining EU members will look for a common ground to move Brexit onto the next stage. Well, where are they? Let's take a look at this. Calls for a coherent migrant policy. Despite the EU stepping up efforts to prevent arrivals and outsource migration responsibility to countries outside their borders, arrivals remain high. Growing anger over immigration is pressuring governments from Germany to Italy. Italy's new populist government is saying no more and has started to turn away ships carrying migrants. The bloc is discussing ways to tighten its borders at the two-day summit. We need to decide without delay. We need to, to stop the illegal immigration. We need to work a lot with Libya. We need to invest money in Libya. And long term, we need to invest money in Africa. And then we need to start also the debate inside the, the European Council, the relocation of the refugees. European Parliament members have long sought consensus on reforming the EU's common migration and asylum rules. But member states are always divided on the subject. Even tweaking so-called Dublin rules has come up again. The UK does not want to provide asylum. And a clear idea of the future of Brexit is up for discussion at the summit, with only nine months left until the UK's departure. A French official said Britain and the EU should prepare for a no-deal Brexit scenario, despite recent progress in negotiations. But the bloc cannot seal a divorce treaty without agreement among all members. Ahead of the Brussels summit, UK Prime Minister Theresa May and European <laughs> Union Council President Donald Tusk met to catch up on the Brexit talks so far. We have been making good progress, but there is more that we uh, want to do and need to do as we look ahead to our future trade and security partnership in, in the future. Meanwhile, the British monarch has approved the first Brexit law. It gives Miss May's government the power to transfer thousands of pieces of European legislation into British law after Brexit. Trade union leaders and Britain's business leaders are joining forces at the pace of negotiations, since threats to jobs and investments inside the UK are increasing because of a looming hard Brexit. And EU leaders are expected to back retaliatory duties against the US during the summit. More on the EU summit, join us from Brussels, Peter Klepp, who is the head of the Brussels Office of the Open Europe. In Southampton, we have Mike Bastian, who is a professor of the University of Southampton. Welcome, gentlemen, to both of you. If I could ask the very first question, that is, uh, whether this summit is going to solve any problem. I mean, after all, the Europeans have been talking about this for a long, long time. Why should we have confidence about them having a solution this time? Professor Bastian? Or should we not? Uh, it remains to be seen. The, obviously, immigration will dominate. That will be the major issue. Um, and the issue there really is the pressure, the huge pressure on Chancellor Merkel. Uh, she is really under pressure primarily from our interior minister, Seehofer, to deliver some sort of solution, bring back some sort of solution to uh, Europe-wide immigration that is acceptable to them and uh, his party, the CSU party, are threatening to actually pull down mm. the coalition. So you'd hope there will be some concrete progress, but, but it remains to be seen because there's hugely uh, uh, divisive yeah. um, opinion across member nations, Italy in particular. If you look at what is going on around the world, uh, Mr. Clapp, when it comes to immigration problems, migrants problems, it's always a big a controversial topic, but I'm already having some fatigue uh, talking about this topic because we do not have any new development in terms of seeking solutions and consensus. All these new players coming up and say, I'm for this, I'm against this, and yet eventually there's no consensus. Mr. Clapp, can you bring us anything new? 
uh, there is one thing uh, that is new and that is potentially a game changer, and that is uh, the idea that is being agreed now uh, among European leaders uh, to create uh, centers for uh, asylum seekers outside of the EU. So um, until now the problem was that when people were uh, rescued at sea, uh, that um, they would, after they had been fingerprinted, uh, were allowed to continue their uh, trip. Yeah. And this, of course, this uh, granted an incentive to people to risk their lives and cross the Mediterranean and pay a human smuggler. Uh, now, uh, if they would be brought after they've been rescued to some center outside of the EU, some safe place, uh, where they can await their asylum request, then people that would not have a chance to get asylum All would right. likely um, no longer take the risk. If you take a look at some of the data some of migrants and refugees entering Europe over the years, let's take a look at some of these numbers. It shows that over the 33,000 migrants entered Europe from January to June this year. They mainly entered through Spain, Greece and Italy. Since 2015, the EU has asked the other member states to accept the refugee current, currently stranded in those three countries. However, fewer than one-fifth of these refugees were resettled. Germany, France, Sweden took in the majority. But the Czech Republic, who only accepted 12 non-Muslim refugees, well, there are other countries as well. It's not right to just single out one country, yet it shows us how difficult it is and how national interest is taking the priority. And therefore, Professor Bastin, can you help us understand the relationship between, or rather the differences between the Europeans' migration problems and that is going on inside America? Is the logic similar or very different? Of course, you have a group that you have to agree on policies. But besides that, fundamentally, what is it? I think there are, there are differences and there are also similarities. But what's going on in Europe is this, this wave of populism and, and far-right or certainly right-wing governments, particularly in these Visegrad countries, you obviously Hungary, uh, Poland, and, and, and they really are vehemently opposed to taking any share of these migrants. Uh, and, and that leaves other countries exposed to this. Um, and it's their electorate that's really driving this. Mm. Uh, if we come back to Germany, uh, the far-right party there, there'll be elections in autumn, and the far-right party are eyeing further gains and a hold on power, and that really is undermining the coalition. So th there's a real f feeling amongst, I think, the, 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 the electorate, the people of Europe, mm. and possibly America, that they're really, um, they've been abandoned. They're, they're sort of economically being disadvantaged, uh, and they're putting a lot of pressure on their, their, the political system, and, and I think that that's really what's driving this and it's going to take some strong leadership particularly from Merkel and others to actually sort this out and frankly other other European countries have to take their share of, of economic migrants but but as your, your panelist from Brussels says there is progress being made there will be more investment in third countries in African countries to try to dissuade this and nip this problem in the bud stop stop these migrants from taking to the seas well, and the numbers are down even though this is the dominant issue across European countries and, and the European political mm -hmm. system is really being is determined by uh, migrant policy or lack of migrant policy. Yeah, despite of the efforts being made, that even though you tell me it's great news, but these efforts, compared to the enormous amount of demands for better life and people's desire to be a safer place, is uncomparable. This is, could probably only be a drop of water in a big sea. So, now Mr. Klepp, do you really see that things likely to change where actually the Europeans are just coming up with an idea say, okay, I give you the money, I give you some efforts, you guys handle it yourself within your own country, don't come to us. We're going to close our door, but we're going to close our door in a nice way that we take care of you to a certain extent. Well, Europe won't be closed, eh? so uh, actually the challenge is not so much to stop migration, but it is to control migration, to make sure that it happens in a legal way. At the moment, for example, uh, the people who sneak in uh, into Europe in an illegal manner, uh, they are mostly men. Eh? Uh, so uh, one of the ideas is to indeed um, uh, then scrutinize uh, who can uh, get asylum and uh, 
who cannot get asylum. Now, um, indeed, uh, there are big challenges because third countries will need to agree to host these centers. But even there, there may be a backup plan, uh, particularly France and Spain are considering to perhaps mm. use um, Spanish ter territory um, in Africa, the enclaves of Coita and uh, Melilla, yeah. if I have that right, uh, to, uh, to host these uh, centers. So there are solutions, uh, but it, you know, this is very important, even if the numbers are down. In the last five years, around 2.5 million people right. have illegally entered the EU, and uh, given the um, explosion of the population of Africa in the next few decades, uh, we can expect more pressure on the external border. Yes, uh, Professor Bastin, I mean, if you look at those numbers, huge numbers for any country, it's very hard to absorb all of these particularly illegal immigrants. But on the other hand, it, the European countries, especially the EU countries, have been talking about its values of having open door. It's also talking about its values of having a zone, the Schengen zone, for example, that is welcoming, that is opening uh, to the outside world. So mm -hmm. if there is not appropriate policies or only make-up policies be done among the European countries, will that value of so-called Schengen zone, the value of the EU, still stand at all? I think it will. I, I, I think people will see sense. I think the Schengen zone, the Schengen area, has proved a huge success. There needs to be more publicity about the, the success of this zone and, and the free movement, not just for tourism and travel, but also for the business community and mm. industry and industrial growth. Um, the European economy, I think, will, 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 will gain momentum, will become stronger. And I think with that, pe the people of Europe will realize the benefits of this liberal attitude of open borders and transparency. So I think things will change. It needs far more, far more pressure yeah. uh, and far more uh, of an effort to, to stand up to, to the far right with a stronger argument. There's not right. as much passion on the, the, the center-left side as there is on the far right side. I think that's what's missing. Mm. Uh, Mr. Clapp, of course, if you look at the United States, there are enormous amount of debates. One is about the Supreme Court decision recently, and the other is about the separation of families on the border between Mexico and the United States. Both are big political issues with their midterm election. Having said that, though, what will be the result of their national debate and their eventually choice of this issue and having its impact on the Europeans' decision? Would there be any? Well, of course, it's not entirely comparable, but indeed uh, the fact that you have this intense debate uh, in the United States with uh, President Trump uh, taking a, a very particular uh, stance uh, is, of course, uh, also having an influence on the, on the European debates. Uh, I think people will perhaps uh, be less shy to defend uh, firm solutions. Uh, for uh, border protection. Now, you know, I agree with uh, the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, who has just said that if you don't take uh, firm action, uh, then people may be uh, lured to supporting some crazy, uh, dangerous, far-right uh, solutions. So we, we don't want that, of course. Uh, but uh, if you allow chaos, uh, for example, what Angela Merkel has done uh, to suspend the Dublin rules, uh, this has really boosted uh, the mm. far right uh, in Europe, unfortunately. Uh, Professor Bastin, do you agree with that? I think by and large, I, I think Tusk is, is right to call for um, leaders to stand up and regain a sense of authority and, and take what might appear in the short term to be pretty unpopular decisions uh, and, and that really is necessary now. We need a pan-European solution uh, to, to immigration. I think that is within reach, that is achievable, but it needs member, member states, member nations to actually stand up, be counted and, and, and again take what appears to be unpopular decisions mm. but publicize the, the benefits in the long term and, and those benefits are real and there's right. a real danger of um, some sort of uh, protectionist uh, f and far-right uh, 
uh, policies creeping that's, into the, to the debate more and more. Professor Bastin, that's the biggest danger, isn't it? I mean, we won't look at the specific issues, the immigration mm -hmm. issues included, but we look at them with the bigger background of what exactly is going on, what is going to be the logic Absolutely. of the international community for the near future. If you look at what's going on inside the United States, if you look at what's going on within the EU countries about the immigration issues, particularly uh, you know, driving them apart from their earlier commitments, you wonder what exactly will be the future that we are going to commit to when we have to face. Professor Bastin mm -hmm. and Mr. Uh, Klepp, very briefly from both of you. Professor Bastin, go first. I'm optimistic. Um, uh, surprisingly, I see the French op uh, offering uh, optimism. I think Macron will push for tighter integration across the mm -hmm. Eurozone, a Eurozone budget, and, and principles there, which are very, very positive. And I think uh, many people will support those. So that's really very much anti protectionist, and that's what All we right. need to see. So, so the French coming forward. Okay. And uh, Mr. Clare? Well, um, as. With regards to the future of the EU, um, I don't think uh, Macron's proposals are the right uh, way forward. Uh, concentrating power and money at the central level is indeed something that acts um, in a protectionist uh, manner. I, I think it's also the quickest way to, to destroy support uh, for the European project. Um, with right. regards to immigration, as I said, I think uh, Africa's population is going to double, triple in the next few decades. Um, so the pressure on the border will continue. Even okay. if Africa becomes wealthier, this actually uh, makes it more likely that people uh, are able to come to Europe. That's what we're seeing in, in practice anyway. We're so running out of time. time. Thank of you so much, uh, Peter Klepp and uh, Mike Bastin. Really appreciate it. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGT into your search engine or try to find us on social media platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Sina Weibo, and from Mi Tianwei and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.